Welcome online, uh, Justin, that's my husband's name. Uh, so welcome guys, thank you for, for coming. Hey guys, good to see you. Uh, so yeah, I was, uh, you know, I feel really appreciative to be here. And a few weeks ago, Terrence and I spoke and Terrence told me that, you know, this is not just stand up, it's a storytelling. So it's kind of a mix of both. And he reassured me and told me, you know, it doesn't have to be entertaining and funny every single second. You know, he said his exact words were just be yourself. And at that point, I got a panic attack. I'm like, you know what? <laughs> I don't think I can do this. Because, uh, you know, my whole life, I've worked really hard to try to be entertaining and funny and not myself. And, uh, you know, really impressed my parents because they were, you know, immigrants, they didn't have too much time for me. Uh, so every time, you know, I got their attention, I'd be like, uh, you know, it's like I'd be pitching to an agent, just a really quick story and come on guys, look at me. Um, so yeah, his exact words of be yourself really frightened me because, you know, my, my, my true self is paralyzed with fear. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you guys could relate, but I'll tell you a quick story. So uh, we defected from Kharkov, Ukraine when I was seven. Uh, it took two months, the immigration took two months and we left with nothing. And I took my first plane ride to America and we get off the plane, we're at the airport. And I remember as a seven-year-old, I was so excited. I don't know if you do this, but I, I was touching everything. You know, when you get to a new place, you're like, how is this, what's going on here? I was running around, just touching everything. And I remember going down uh, the banister, just pawing it completely. And I remember my mom screaming, AIDS, it has AIDS. <laughs> Do not touch that. Everything in America has AIDS. <laughs> I don't know if you guys seen this exact scene in the movie Borat. Uh, I'm not stealing that scene. That was my life. Uh, that, that happened to me uh, exactly like that. Uh, so to this day, you know, the movie Borat is uh, the, the best distinct, you know, the best um, kind of uh, of what Eastern European culture is, you know, it's, uh, that's what it is. Um, or maybe just my family. I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, so yeah, let's take it to the beginning. Okay, so I'm just going to scratch the record. Like, <laughs> um, let's do the heartbeat. Boom, 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 boom. Wah! I was born. Um, so yeah, after 36 uh, hours of labor and um, due to, you know, not uh, any birth control methods in Ukraine and my dad's weak pullout game, I was born. I'm here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's uh, the 80s. It's Kharkov, Ukraine. And um, sorry, there's a lot, a lot of new things that I'm trying to bring back. And, um, you know, okay, so at this time, at this time, it's the USSR. It's the Soviet Union. So it's actually uh, everybody's unified. Ukraine, Russia, there's really no distinction. Everybody in Ukraine is speaking Russian, they're writing Russian. Uh, they're reading Russian, especially what's really devastating right now is um, Kharkov is only 20 miles away from the border of Russia. So there was really no distinction. It's the same people, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, they're very, very similar. Uh, this is why this is so strange right now to see uh, Russia invading Ukraine. I, I really don't think anybody wants this war, you know? It's, one tyrant, because uh, Russia and Ukraine, they're brothers, they're sisters, they're the same people. Uh, what I use as an example is, it's like if Cuomo, right, stopped grabbing ass for a few minutes and ordered New York to invade New Jersey. It's the same. <laughs> That's what's happening right now. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, that's what it is. That's what's happening. It's, it's very, very strange. and. You know, now the, the, the country has progressed. You're seeing uh, a Jewish comedian actor who's president. But I have to discuss that for hundreds of years, it was very anti-Semitic, you know? Um, so, I mean, my joke is, you know, uh, oh, you're good, don't worry. Um, <laughs> by the way, it's like helpful for me to have some noise because I have a nine-year-old son. So I always need, you know, he's always like heckling me. So no, I, yeah, I appreciate you. This is comfortable for me. Okay. Um, <laughs> So yeah, uh, you know, 
Ukraine was very anti-Semitic and didn't like the Jews and Russia didn't like the Jews. Uh, so this is why it's so strange because, you know, they should be celebrating now. This is the paradise that they always wanted. My family and I have left Ukraine many years ago and most of the Jews have left. So um, that's, that's my joke. But the, the truth is uh, when I was coming over here, um, you know, it was very strange because um, my passport, right? My seven-year-old passport didn't even say citizen. Uh, the Jewish people were considered second-class citizens. So if you're born um, in Ukraine and Russia and you're not Jewish, it would say Ukrainian or Russian. But if you were Jewish, you were considered, do you have the same, or you know about this, yeah. You were considered um, less than, so a lot of Jewish people couldn't go to certain schools and colleges um, and belong to certain organizations. It's kind of crazy that it was so recent. Uh, so yeah, my passport, um, seven, it's my seven-year-old face, and next to it, it just says Jew. Wow. Yeah, and I was like, you know what, these anti-Semites, they're a little too blunt, okay? <laughs> I'd be like, this is kind of rude, you know, because everybody's just Jew. My mother, my father, my brother, you know, in, in Russian and in Ukrainian, there's male form, there's female form, there's older, more respectful form. You know, I'm just saying I would have appreciated Lily of Judas, okay? Because that would have been a really great <laughs> rapper name for me right now, you know? Um, I talk a lot about rap uh, and rap culture and how that's influenced me growing up in Brooklyn. Um, but yeah, it, it was uh, very strange. Um, but it is, it is amazing to see the bravery of the Ukrainian people, to see President Zelensky uh, you know, be so brave. And yeah, he was a Jewish comedian and actor. So at this point, it is like watching the moving Glorious Bastards Ukraine edition, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, it's it's pretty badass, it's awful. But it's also, um, a few weeks ago, I was looking at the New York Times and I saw this woman who looks exactly like me, this Ukrainian woman. She had two blonde pigtails, thank you. She had two blonde pigtails and a pearl earrings and a pearl ring and an AK-47. Mm -hmm. You know, and as awful as it is, it really is badass, and it is so brave. And I want you all to know here and over there that even though we look alike, uh, we are nothing alike. I am a coward through and through. I am not as brave as those women. We uh, ran when there wasn't clear and imminent danger, and I will run again. I will run again. Um, but yeah, I want to tell you guys a funny story. Um, so I don't know if you guys know. Uh, Coming from Brooklyn, there's the every year there's the West Indian Day Parade. I don't know if you guys heard of it. Yeah. Uh, we live right, right, right by it in Crown Heights for the last ten years. And my son and my husband, we go every year. My son is now nine years old, and uh, we have a good time. But a lot of times things pop off. So a few <laughs> years ago, as you guys know, a few years ago we went. And we hear gunshots and everybody starts running and I just jet off without looking back at my family. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it was like I was at the, for those of you who know Matoga, it was like I was at the NFL Combine and I ran a 4 4 40. Um, That means I ran 40 yards in four seconds. Uh, so I think what I'm trying to tell you guys is I could make the NFL if somebody was shooting at me and I had a penis. I think that's the requirement. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I, I jet off so quickly. I make it home in no time. Uh, my husband, who's carrying our son, uh, is like, you're not even going to look back for us? And I was like, listen, <laughs> when we took our vows, I said till death do us part. Not that when we go to a parade, I will be used as human shield uh, to protect you and your son. He's his son at that point. He's our son. But you know, at that point, it becomes his responsibility. Um, but yeah, he's... I also like how our priorities are different. You know, I think, I don't know, I blame this on being an immigrant, but uh, my priority and my nine-year-old son knows this, uh, my motto is each man for themselves. Uh, so that's, you know, my priority was me saving myself. My son had an ice cream at that point uh, that he wasn't gonna let go of. And he didn't want the scoop to drop, um, he was about five. And my husband was trying to save his family. So very lucky to have a husband like that. Um, but yeah, uh, I have to mention um, the small town. Um, it was called Bereshit. Uh, it actually looks a lot like what we're looking at right now in this gallery. Couldn't be more fitting. Um, and 
it's called, it, it is it is pronounced bear shit. Uh, and my bear shit. <laughs> and my Italian American husband, when I first mentioned this, I never thought about it. And he was like, it's actually called bear shit. I'm like, yeah, and I think it probably smelled like it. But um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's called bear shit. And it was uh, a town where they uh, made a lot of Jewish people uh, live there. So they would take a lot of people from Ukraine and, and Russia, and they would have to move there. And it was a bit, it was, it was the Jewish ghetto. Um, and my dad lived there up until he was 14, uh, up until he got to apprentice in another town in Ukraine called Donetsk. So at the ripe old age of 14, he was already working full time. Uh, but no, it was, a, it was, a, I have fond memories of it. Um, my, uh, grandmother, my grandfather and my aunt lived there and it was like our hangout spot. We'd go every few months, um, and connect with family. Uh, so yeah. In general, my life in Kharkov, Ukraine was pretty nice. You know, we lived in a really nice apartment. It was a beautiful town. Um, we ate good food. We uh, went on road trips. Uh, and actually, uh, a few weeks ago, I found out that my childhood apartment was bombed. Yeah, and it, it was very, it was very um, upsetting. Um, and, you know, I, I told this to my husband. We've been together for a very long time. And my husband and said, you know, you know, I got incinerated and that could have been me. And I look at his eyes and I saw a little glimmer of hope. And then it slow, it quickly died. And I'm like, I'm still here. I'm just self-deprecating. He could have gotten rid of me long ago, but he's still with me um, hearing these stories. But yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty upsetting. Um, but yeah, life, life was, was not bad. Uh, I had a pretty nice childhood, but there was always very weird things lurking underneath. So, you know, the heavy anti-Semitism, I would hear my parents talk about jail time. You never know when you could be thrown in. Um, so if you're uh, not declaring everything you own or even uh, the grandparents would leave jewelry behind or uh, precious belongings, you have to declare that to the government and they could take it away. Um, they could take away your apartment. They they pretty much own everything. So there would be those very dark things lurking. Um, and uh, my parents wanted to leave for years. They wanted to leave before they had me 10 years prior, but the grandparents passed away at a very young age, the, uh, three of them at the age of 60 and 61. So they finally got their chance. I was seven years old. And one day we were walking with my dad, um, just taking a stroll. And my dad was like, so what do you think? Should we, should we immigrate to America? And I was like, yeah, why not? You know, sounds, sounds good to me. Yeah, like most young women, I didn't know what I was consenting to, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Thinking back at it, I am not so sure. Now, now I'm sure. But um, <laughs> yeah, it, cause you know, um, first we, we had to go, uh, through Moscow um, mm. and say goodbye to my, my parents' friends. They escorted us off. We spent the night, we celebrated. And the next day we were on a train to Austria, um, you know, waving goodbye. It was pretty emotional, but luckily being seven, uh, you know, I think I didn't deal with that emotion until later, which I'm very fortunate to have lots of therapy. So don't worry, I'm okay, everybody. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I think that was Gorbachev. So yeah, I remember my dad uh, loved making fun of his birthmark. That was uh, something yeah, he engaged in regularly. <laughs> that was comic relief. Uh, yeah, those were it's so funny because the, the Soviet times were uh, regarded as something you know positive, and uh, people have fond memories, even though there was a lot of things wrong with that. Um, but yeah, then we were off to Austria, and guys, the whole reason I agreed to the whole trip is I thought we were going to Australia. <laughs> As a seven-year-old, I thought we were going to Australia and we get to Austria and my parents are like, oh, look, this is the house where Hitler was born. And I said, like, Hitler, where, where are the kangaroos? Yeah. Oh, so after, you know, a couple of weeks of zero kangaroo sightings, you know, uh, and I, I did not become the master boomerang champion. I thought I was going to become, um, but I did see my mother cry every night. So kind of worth it. I don't know. Uh, 
But uh, there were some very strange things when we first got there. We were uh, a couple nights, there was a basement and we would uh, have dinner there and we'd have to eat um, canned goods and all the other refugees were eating that. So I was like, okay, this is slightly different, uh, but you know, it's temporary. Um, and then there was another scene where uh, they gathered all the, the, the immigrants, the refugees, and um, there was a few advocates uh, to get them to go to Israel. So, because um, it was all Jewish refugees. And uh, the deal was, if you choose to go to Israel, they have a limousine ready for you and they're gonna escort you to the airport. Or airport and it was an easy immigration. But my parents wanted to go to America. So uh, most of the immigrants stepped up and were taken to Israel and my parents uh, stayed back and we stayed in Austria for another week. Um, and then we were off to Italy. Um, yeah, so Italy, you know, uh, I was a little more excited about Italy than Austria. <laughs> I was like, all right, here, here goes. Let's see, let's let's get this immigration. Uh, let's have a little fun, you know, I'm seven. I don't know what is going on. Um, but yeah, we get there and it's not great because uh, we, we, we were looking at the next place we we're gonna live. Um, and it was a complex, uh, I remember there was, bunch of trees and these animals that I thought were squirrels with very long Milan high fashion tails, uh, 10, to, 10 to 15 of them per tree. They were rats. They were not, no, they were not uh, exotic animals. Again, no kangaroos, uh, no exotic animals. Uh, so that was, that definitely stayed with me. I remember everyone kind of gasping. Uh, so we stayed in Italy for about, uh, 24 days. I remember because my parents kept saying that over and over. Um, we're Jewish. We're going to complain a lot, no matter where we are. Um, it's in the culture. It helps us get through. Uh, but yeah, it, it was, uh, you know, when you uh, see things that young, it really, really stays with you. So, you know, I would see my mother selling clothes on the streets mm -hmm. of Italy to make a, because we were going there with, with nothing. Uh, so she would try to make a, a couple of extra uh, lyrics. Uh, and uh, my brother, he would actually go into the ocean and he would catch octopus and he would make it for dinner. Yeah. And, you know, what I did was, um, seven year old, I watched uh, the Italian people. And guys, I became a master cat caller. You know, I was like, <laughs> come on, Tom, please, oh, baby, come over here. <laughs> Uh, to this day, when I see a beautiful curvy woman, you know, I think I'm straight, but I can't help myself. Like, oh, okay, cool. so, oh, no. uh, yeah, my husband, who happens to be Italian American, even he's like, what are you doing? See, she's just trying to get a cup of coffee, you know? Um, yeah, so, so then, yeah, we get to America. I told you that Borat story. Um, and we were very lucky because my my uh, dad's cousin, who had been living um, in New York for 20 years prior, she immigrated. Uh, she took us in, which we, we had no idea. No, there was a few other relatives, but they wanted you know nothing to do with us, as my parents say. But this woman uh, and her husband took us in, and they uh, the next day they found an apartment for, for my parents and uh, school for me and the. Uh, um, cousin, she took my, uh, my cousin, who's about my age, um, to see Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I don't know if you guys, <laughs> yes, which was, you know, it's an amazing movie. First of all, I have to tell you, where she lived was, uh, we get to East New York, and, you know, when I was seven in Ukraine, I pictured Beverly Hills, you know? So when I get to East New York in, in the early 90s, I'm like, this is not the Beverly Hills. I'm not seeing palm trees. What is, this is not what I pictured. Um, and uh, yeah, so then the next day she takes us to see Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and, you know, great movie. Now I'm a huge fan. But uh, when I first saw it, it was such a culture shock because I'm, I'm seeing, you know, crime, I'm seeing the sewer, I'm seeing a, a rat, and I'm like, this is dark stuff, like, what is happening here? It, it seemed very, uh, I couldn't quite digest it. Um, speaking of digestion, she took us to McDonald's after, which, again, what a treat, right? It was, uh, she got us the Happy Meal, 
But I got to tell you, I, I still, I'm not sure why they call it the Happy Meal, because that's not what I was feeling when I was in the bathroom that night. Uh, so yeah, it was a lot of things for my stomach and my emotionally, it all seemed very dark and dreary. Um, and it was, it was a lot to get used to. Um, but I, I do have to go back to Italy. One, one story that I forgot to say, when we were um, in Italy, uh, about a week before we were uh, released to America, I remember all the other, so what we had to do is we had to go to the consulate to get permission to go to America. So uh, the other immigrants and refugees that we were around and staying with, um, they had a tactic. Their tactic was, we're gonna dress really badly, we're gonna be, look really depressed, uh, you know, <laughs> we're gonna uh, look very much like we need help. Um, and that was a tactic to, you know, then they're gonna wanna send us to America. My parents, they were the, they were the only couple that said, we're gonna take a totally different approach. We are gonna dress in our finest clothes. We're gonna be as presentable as possible uh, because what we want is we wanna be an asset to this new country. We don't wanna be a liability. That always gets me very emotional because I think taking such a strong uh, uh, position is really admirable because it, it was such an unsure time, but they, the fact that they went in with it with strength was really remarkable. I mean, to this day, I'm still recovering from not always looking perfect and being perfect. So that, that definitely had a lot of emotional damage as a child in which I worked through in therapy. I'm okay, uh, everybody. Um, um, I did realize that I you know, had to be presentable all the time, but that was something so beautiful to me. And they were the only ones that were let out uh, mm. to go to America a few days later and everybody else was staying behind uh, for a few months. So um, yeah, to this day, I really uh, find it amazing to be so strong and uh, make such strong decisions. Uh, so yeah, back, back to dreary America. No, I, uh, yeah, it was, it was definitely, not what I expected, um, but I, I am grateful for it. You know, uh, I had, I started to become a latchkey kid. So my, my brother, he was 10 years older. He had to go off to work and school. My parents both had to uh, work. And I, I did live only a block away, you know, from the school, uh, which I had to walk uh, back and forth myself. I had the keys, but it did, it did feel like a lot longer than, than a block. And I had to stay at home for a few hours myself and make dinner. Uh, it just, it did feel very strange that I didn't understand what was happening in school. I didn't understand what was happening at home on the TV. I, it, it was like uh, the cartoon, uh, Mr. Peanut, where the teacher is like, wah, 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 wah. that was me for the first like three to five months in America. Um, it was very uh, confusing. Um, but I did, I did learn English pretty quickly, uh, and I'm really thankful to uh, watching a lot of TV. That's how I learned um, the language, and uh, I watched a lot of sitcoms. And I remember, you know, but that that did cause a lot of culture clash between my parents, and you know, it was a language barrier because one day my mom came home, and I was watching TV pretty loudly, uh, and she was like, you know, turn it off. Uh, um, I know it sounds very intimidating in Russian. So, you know, and I was like, you know what? What you're talking about, Willis? Uh, <laughs> so, she didn't understand what I was talking about. Um, I also watched a lot of MTV, which, uh, yeah, a lot of MTV. I really became a fan of rap music. And um, if you ever watch my stand up set, I have at least 15 or 20 minutes on rappers. I think I'm the only uh, former refugee that knows so much about rap, but that's that, that's for the stand up. Um, <laughs> but a lot of MTV really influenced me, the rap culture, um, so much so that when my mother's uh, friend came to visit, uh, I was about 11 years old. Um, so she hasn't seen me in about four years. And when I left uh, at seven, you know, I had pigtails and a dress, and when she came to visit, uh, I dressed like Snoop Dogg. You know, it was a lot of blue flannel shirts, and I called everybody cuz. So she was pretty shocked that it was happening. Um, but 
Yeah, it was uh, supermarkets, you know, regular supermarkets were overwhelming for us. They were very exciting. It was, it was like almost like a museum, but they were, they were so overwhelming to see 30 options of the same thing. Uh, I don't know if you guys seen it, ever seen, I think it was on the Hudson with, uh, yeah, so it was a similar kind of like, what, this is too much for us, uh, but it was amazing especially seeing so much baby forming because that that didn't exist in ukraine and russia for so long um, so this would be very common where you know we didn't have any baby formulas so the women who couldn't produce or didn't produce enough would share with another woman the breast milk and um, so much it's so uh common that there's even a, a name for it um it's called uh, milk brothers um, so even my brothers, brothers, exactly, yes, I know, sisters, it should be, I'm still, I'll get to that. It's a weirdly chauvinist, even though the women um, were in the workforce in the 1800s. It's a very strange culture in that way. But yeah, they're, they're called milk brothers. Um, so my brother would actually uh, have to drink milk from, um, who's now my mother's best friend, but a woman who also gave birth around the same time. Um, so again, there was a culture clash because even to this day, when I when I hear the term Eskimo brothers, I'm like, oh, they're sharing ice cream together. That's really <laughs> sweet. That is that's what's happening. Um, it's a lot, a lot of culture clashes. Um, but yeah, yeah, supermarkets were overwhelming. Um, and so, you know, uh, I wish I could come and tell you that the my parents and I relationship is perfect, but you know, the, the immigration and being a refugee definitely um, put a lot of strain uh, language-wise. It's hard to understand and culture-wise, there's a lot of differences. Um, you know, I, I admire them. Uh, I think they, they admire me now, but it's, um, it's strange uh, to ever complain to my parents. You know, I never, I never could complain. I, I, I'm a stand-up comedian now, which is, I feel very lucky to be doing that. But I would hold a lot of different, very terrible day jobs. And, you know, uh, my parents don't understand that. They think everything in America is perfect. And it's not, you know. Um, but anytime, uh, you know, I would have a very terrible day job, my mom would always say, this is a very good job. You should keep this <laughs> job, you know. Uh, guys, I could be working for ISIS. And my mom would be like, you know, this is a very good job. You should keep this job because it's a very big organization. <laughs> you know, strong management, great pictures. I mean, your eyes really stand out with the long beards. Uh, she does sound like a vampire. I don't know if you guys caught that. Uh, <laughs> the other kind of, I guess, fun thing is um, even when we go on family vacations, you know, there was definitely a culture clash. As I'm saying this, again, I don't know if it's uh, the whole culture or my parents, but uh, either way, welcome to the next part I'm about to tell you. Um, so my husband, uh, when we first started dating, he found pictures of our family vacation when I was about 10 or 11 years old. And uh, I had blocked those things out because uh, it would be pictures that my dad would take and my mom would post next to anything that looked like a fabric symbol. Uh, and and uh, so it looked like a penis. My mom was right there posing next to me. That's, uh, I think they were just so grateful to be in this country that they're like, we'll do anything to show our appreciation. Yeah, there you go. Oh, don't get my mom, please. Let's not have her here. Oh, this the thing she could do with this. Uh, uh, she would become a climber in no time. Thank you for that. That's a gift that just keeps on giving. Um, when it's not too sturdy, that's good. Thank God. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, yeah. So I think I blocked that whole thing out. And I was like to my husband, don't all families have fun this way, you know, show their pretty. He's like, no, this is, this is strange. Um, <laughs> guys, uh, the things my mom did to the indigenous people, fertility statues. Uh, I'm still too shy to try and do it. Yeah. Uh, those poor dinosaur bones, you know. Mm -hmm. After my mom got through with them, even they were like, hashtag me too. You know? <laughs> Let's just say my mom is banned from the Museum of Natural History for life. And, and hopefully open source gallery as well. <laughs> Don't let her in here. Uh, <laughs> she'll be having too much fun. Yeah. So a lot of, lot of differences between us. Um, 
I uh, think it's important to mention that I was a, a Latin dancer. I was ranked seventh in the United States. Yeah, you see my peers there in Dancing with the Stars. Funny thing is, uh, it's a lot of Ukrainians. Um, I think Ukrainians, Latin dance, something's in the water. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of Maxim Tchernikovsky and Karina Smirnov. Yeah, they're my... Um, uh, Marina's from Kharkov as well. She actually trained the studio that was right across the street from me. It's a famous Latin dance studio and uh, Maxim, I knew them well. Um, but um, I will share this with you guys. Uh, I think it's interesting and I like you. I had the worst <laughs> Latin dancer stage name ever. <laughs> it was Svetlana Feldman. <laughs> that is not a great Latin dancer stage name. Uh, <laughs> You know, it would be really embarrassing because the announcer would be like, and now dancing the very sexy cha-cha-cha, Svetlana, Feldman, that, that can't be, can't be right. <laughs> yeah, I had a lot of, I'm thankful for it now, but it was very confusing growing up. I had so many cultures coming my way, uh, you know, living in New York and, and Brooklyn. Um, so I, at the age of about 12, 13, when I was at the height of my Latin dancing, uh, I was going to a yeshiva, which is a all Jewish, all girls school. Uh, it was very confusing for me because, you know, uh, a lot of my friends, they would be waiting for their bat mitzvah. I don't know if you guys know that uh, when a Jewish girl becomes a Jewish woman at 12, which I think is all young, but, you know, that's uh, not for me to judge. But, um, yeah, I was just waiting for, for my quinceanera, you know, because the Latin dancing, <laughs> I don't know if you guys... <laughs> That's when you're 15 and you put on a wedding dress and you marry yourself. I just think it's a little bit less creepy. Um, but no, I never got a quinceanera. I never got a quinceanera. But because of the dancing uh, and a lot of pressure that I put on myself, and I think it has to do with being an immigrant and really trying to make it in this country, um, I never got a quinceanera, but I did have a lot of eating disorders, which, you know, I'm healed from right now. Uh, again, I was very lucky to get lots of help and support. Um, but, you know, I had uh, anorexia, which was not for too long, and to this day, it wasn't all that bad because, you know, we were poor growing up, but I did eat vegetables all day. So at this point, it would just be, you know, me being a grumpy vegan. That's all that was. Uh, uh, I had bulimia, which also that was many years ago, and again, glad to be completely recovered from it. But um, I am proud of it to this day because, you know, that's the only thing that Princess Diana and I have in common. Mm -hmm. So kind of royalty at this point. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, that's that. Um, yeah. Just a few things, I guess. Um, yeah, I, uh, I have to say it's been very empowering getting to tell my story and being a stand up and going through the things I, I went through um, because, you know, I don't know if you guys knew this, but um, when you're a woman and you're Eastern European and you're, first of all, I don't know if you've heard of Mila Kunis, she's stepping mm -hmm. up now, she's Ukrainian. Um, I, I personally think I'm a lot more exotic because I'm a chubby <laughs> Ukrainian Jewish woman. You don't see a lot of us, you know, we're coming out of the woodwork um, and, uh, you know, I, I love who I am. I own it. You know, I'm a mom as well. And um, this is where usually I get a big clap, like, yeah. And I'm like, what choice do I have? But no, I really do. Uh, I think it's important for women to, to own who they are. And, uh, you know, but it is Eastern European women, when, you, when you're a little bit heavier, uh, they kick you out of the whole group. I don't know if you guys knew this. Yeah, recently I got a letter from Melania Trump, you know, letter <laughs> <laughs> terminating my membership <laughs> from the United States chapter of Eastern European Women, the USCEW. Yeah, I had to turn in my um, eyeliner and knock off Chanel purse <laughs> into the Slovenian embassy. Uh, you know, it was it was a real low point for me. You know, much like a, a, a cop who has to turn in his gun and badge, uh, it wasn't a great day. But there's still so much pressure, you know, on weight. And, uh, you know, I'm still trying to lose my pregnancy weight. You know? I mean, my son is nine, but whatever, it stays with you. Everyone's so judgmental. Uh, <laughs> my, uh, my grandmother and mother, they had a lot of trouble losing their uh, pregnancy weight. The only one who lost her pregnancy weight was my great grandmother. 
I don't think any of us would want to try the Auschwitz diet. I mean, she got down to a size two, but she didn't look that good. Okay, the whole point, I know it's a joke, everyone shrugs, but my whole point is, uh, as women, we have a lot more important things than to worry about our weight. Um, and I feel grateful that, uh, you know, I don't have to worry about that. And what I have to worry about is accomplishing more, getting my voice heard, and hopefully helping people. Um, so now at this point, my only goal is if I can walk through the door without doing this, <laughs> I'm good guys, mm -hmm. I'm good. If I can walk through the door by just doing this, goal met, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> if I can walk through the door without it looking like I'm starting a soul train line, Go achieved. Go achieved, everybody. So, um, yeah, it, uh, it, it is very empowering uh, being a comedian. Um, and I don't think I've seen a lot of Eastern European, Ukrainian women uh, be stand up comics. Uh, so, uh, but it is, it is a strange profession uh, to be a, a comedian because your whole life you're waiting for opportunities, right? And you hear, you're constantly hearing laughter is the best medicine. Um, so you're constantly waiting for someone to yell out in a crowded room, is there a comedian in the house? We're looking for a comedian. <laughs> we have a person who is having a heart attack. Please step up. You're like, I'm coming, I'm here. I'm here, I'm ready for the opportunity. And you see the person, you're like, have you heard the one about going through the door like it's a soul train line? <laughs> Yeah, we look over and they're like, hmm, they didn't your joke didn't help, but you know, at least you had a lot of hope. You had a lot of hope uh, that it would. Um, the next part, I'm trying to, no notes, but this this part, uh, I, I apologize. I'm going to just look through because I don't want to. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so um, here's the funny thing about, we're talking about uh, it being a strange culture where it's, a little bit chauvinistic, but at the same time, women were in the workforce uh, before the women in, in even America were. So uh, funny thing about the USSR is that a lot of women are doctors and dentists. Um, and you know this was considered a woman's job because you couldn't make too much money doing it because it was so heavily regulated. Um, and so my grandmother is a dentist, she was a dentist, My mother uh, was a dentist uh, up until recently and uh, I am not a dentist so this has caused a lot of tension uh, but I'll, I digress so guys if you see a, a woman um, from Ukraine or Russia uh, you know from the former Soviet Union uh, who's in her 60s or 70s chances are she was a doctor or a dentist um, and uh, um, yeah it, so the men, what the men would do to make more money was a lot of them were hustlers and salesmen and uh, work manual labor because they could make more money than someone who's a, a doctor or a dentist profession. Wow. Um, yeah, because that wasn't heavily regulated. Um, and uh, but the thing with that is the catch. The catch with that is is um, even though it wasn't heavily regulated. A lot of them uh, would get into uh, trouble because if you don't declare everything you sell to the government, the KGB could just take you off and throw you into jail. So that was very common. Your men would be thrown into jail. You know, you could be selling uh, a teapot set on the street and you don't declare it or you forget, you're thrown in. Um, a minor thing like that. So my, uh, my grandfather would be going in and out of jail a lot. He was a salesman. He was a hustler. He was good at what he did. Um, he was also, what he learned in jail uh, was his trade, which he was a, a barber. He cut hair. And he was the worst barber in Parco, if you pray. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> he had the, but he'd learned a terrible method in jail. Uh, he would take a bow and put it on someone's head and just cut around it. So that was his that. method. You did that too, yeah. <laughs> probably should have learned from you because somehow maybe the bowl wasn't right. I don't know. Uh, but it just, uh, yeah, got to be worse at something. Um, but um, so, yeah, it was, it was very difficult for my grandmother. who She worked in a hospital. She was a dentist and uh, she had to get my grandfather a 
she would work long hours in the hospital as a dentist, and she would sometimes have to bail my grandfather out of jail. And she had two kids that she was taking care of, my mother and my uncle, and um, she needed someone to take care of her kids. Um, and so one day, uh, she goes to work, she goes to the hospital, and she's walking by this young person who's on the hospital floor, and that person is somebody who I consider my second grandmother. Mm -hmm. Her name is Natasha. Sorry, I get all emotional. Um, her name is Natasha. She had an extraordinary, difficult life. Uh, Natasha, uh, her family uh, was killed off in World War II and the Holocaust. She's not Jewish, but she, she had to go to concentration camps. Um, her the Nazis operated on her. She had a long scar up until she passed away she, her whole life. Um, but she was uh, an incredible woman. Um, my grandmother took her in. She became part of the family. She became the second mother to my mom. She took care of her. And uh, when, I, when I think about what's happening in Ukraine right now, think of Natasha. Mm. Um, and uh, this is the part where I don't want to get wrong for Natasha. Um, think of Natasha. So that's how I know. That's how I know. Even though it's an incredibly dark time for the people in Ukraine, people in Ukraine will persevere. Finding a family when you lost your own that will carry the people of Ukraine through this horrific time. Thank you guys. I appreciate all of you. And um, I'm very grateful to tell my story. Thank you so much.